So, my name is Nigel Cooper. I practice in commercial litigation and arbitration, particularly in the fields of shipping, energy and insurance. My Qubit talk today is what is the prevention principle? And I'm asking this question and intending to answer it because the principle provides a potentially potent defence to a contracting party who is alleged to be in default of their contractual obligations, but considers that that default is only a consequence of the other party's conduct. For the purposes of answering this question, what is the prevention principle? I will be covering the following four topics. What is the prevention principle? What are the remedies? When is it of use? What are the particular hurdles if you are seeking to rely on the principle? Now, there is a debate in English law as to whether or not the principle is a rule of law or a question of the construction of the particular contract. But most of the time, we don't need to worry about that debate. However, it seems to be settled that the principle is one which arises as a matter of construction of the relevant contract. And it follows that the terms of the contract are therefore going to be important in determining the scope of the principle in any particular case. In its narrow form, the prevention principle can be expressed in the following terms. A party will not, in normal circumstances, be entitled to take advantage of their own wrong as against the other party. In other words, if the reason is that one party has not been able to perform a contract because the other party has prevented that party from performing the contract, then that non-performance will be excused. Now, in certain circumstances where the terms of the contract allow, there can be a wider duty implied, and that is namely a positive duty on one party to cooperate with the other party to enable that first party to fulfil its contractual obligations. Now, just to give you a very simple example of how this might work, if you have a contract, for example, which requires the contractor to ensure that certain equipment, goods and materials are on site by a particular deadline. And in order to achieve that particular deadline, the contractor requires the assistance of the employer to obtain the necessary import licenses, for example. Then, now ordinarily, that kind of situation is going to be covered by the express terms of the contract. Sometimes, however, it's not. And in those circumstances, one can say that it is reasonably necessary to imply a duty on the part of the employer to cooperate with the contractor to obtain the licences. And that is an example of the wider form of the prevention principle. So that's what the prevention principle is. What are the remedies you might be looking for? Well, first of all, the defensive remedies. Very often, the prevention principle is being used to prevent the other party relying on an act of default to terminate the contract. In other words, you're trying to suspend or prevent the operation of a right of termination. Alternatively, you may be looking to suspend the running of time or postpone a deadline, and with it, any obligations, for example, to pay liquidated damages. Now, those are the, as it were, the defensive remedies. Of course, in an appropriate case, where the act of prevention is a breach of contract or a tortious wrong, then there's also a right to claim damages. And those damages will be, essentially, the losses that flow from the act of prevention, from the breach of contract by the other party. And that might include the loss of the contract. So those are the remedies. When is the principle of use? Of course, as you probably picked up from what I've already said, many of the cases concerning the application of the prevention principle arise in the context of construction, whether it's onshore construction, whether it's offshore construction, marine construction. But the, the principle isn't limited to this field. It applies to any contract where one party's performance may be hindered or prevented by the other party's conduct. So, for example, there are cases where the prevention principle has been relied on to try and prevent the accrual of demurrage. There have also been one of the leading cases concerns the use of the principle to stop one party to a loan agreement relying on non-payment by the other party as an event of termination under the loan agreements. And of course, you'll see its use in the context of other forms of commercial agreement, for example, joint ventures or shareholder agreements. 
But what are the potential defences? First of all, on the proper construction of the contract, the party in default may be found to have agreed to perform, even if the other party has hindered or prevented that performance. Secondly, the application of the prevention principle may be excluded by the terms of the contract, and that can arise in two ways. First of all, the relevant act may actually be expressly dealt with by the terms of the contract. So there's no need for an implied term. Secondly, there may be a term which excludes or restricts reliance on the prevention principle. But of course, in that context, you then flow into another principle, which will be that you need clear and unambiguous language if the contract is to have that effect. Now again, just looking back at one of the leading cases, TMI and fire insurance, there was an attempt in that case to rely on a no set-off clause as excluding the right to rely on the prevention principle. And in that case, the court said, no, that doesn't work because the principle was being relied on for defensive purposes only and therefore it wasn't caught by the exclusion of claims for damages, under, for example, under the no set-off provision. More generally, there are some wider considerations in terms of reliance on the principle. First of all, if an implied term imposing or allowing the reliance on the prevention principle is argued for, that implied term cannot be illegal or contrary to public policy. So, for example, you cannot rely on the principle in order to try and restrict a public authority act exercising their functions in the interest of the public good. Secondly, the principle is limited to active acts of prevention. It doesn't apply to passive prevention, nor more generally will you be able to rely on the principle to imply a term requiring a party to facilitate the other party's performance of the contract. Of course, you can also come back to the whole question of causation. That's generally a question of fact, and the question will be, has the act of prevention in fact caused the other party's non-performance of the contract? And that, that issue can be particularly potent in circumstances where you have questions of concurrent causation. So to give you a simple example, uh, an employer asks for variations to the contract which will add time to the completion of the contract or of the project in question. However, the contractor is already behind with other works such that any additional time required for the work covered by the variation would not otherwise delay final completion. Now, in that kind of circumstance, the likely outcome is that there's going to be no causative act of prevention. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that in a nutshell is the prevention principle. Thank you very much. <laughs>